And we're going to begin this new sermon series with a word on desperation. So I want you to open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. And we're going to get started here. Once you've found it in the Bible, or even before then, would you mind to stand with me for the reading of the word? If you're new here, this is a tradition that we keep that we would stand in honor of the scripture. And what we love to do is read it all out loud together as a family. I've got a lot of Bible to get us started here. I'm going to begin in verse 1, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. And then I'm going to read all the way to verse 20. If you're here for it, just say, I'm here for it. That's what I'm talking about. I knew I loved the 1030 service. All right, you ready? All right, let's read it. There was a certain man of Ramathame Zophim. Could anybody pronounce that? I don't know. That's, a, that's tongues right there. I don't know if that is English. Of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jerome, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth, and Ephrathite. We did it. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. So right away, you're noticing three main characters. Elkanah, Hannah, and Peninnah. Verse 3. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed... He would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion. Everybody say double portion. portion. Somebody say, I'm going to take that, Lord. That's good, a double portion. We like that. Because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, now say it with a question mark at the end, her rival? Her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Everybody say, Hannah. Hannah. Chill out. (laughs) After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. And Hannah was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Everybody say, "Desperation." desperation. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, that I will give to him, to the Lord, all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. And as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth, and Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah said, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. Everybody say desperation. Desperation. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Everybody say desperation. desperation. Then Eli answered, well, go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord, and they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She conceived 
and bore a son. Just sneaking this in, every time you see this in the Bible, you'll recognize as to when God points to when life begins. She conceived and then bore a son. Life does not begin when a baby is born. Life begins when it's conceived in the womb. You'll see this time and time and time again. And in due time, Hannah conceived and then bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, which is the prophet that God said none of his words fall to the ground and die. This is the most accurate prophet of the Old Testament. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Somebody say, give it to me. Mm. My goodness, we came to have church this morning. The title of the message today is An Impartation of Desperation. Lord, we pray a scary prayer right now, and we ask you for an impartation of desperation. God, would you anoint our hearts to soften before you so that we might receive the great seed of God? Sow it down deep into our spirits today and let it bear 100-fold fruit. God, I ask that you would anoint me as the communicator today to share what it is the Holy Spirit wants to share, and no more, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah. What a good passage of Scripture, huh? So when you look at uh, the first two verses of Scripture, 1 Samuel chapter 1 is giving you a little bit of context, giving you a little bit of backstory for what's happening. So what you have here is you have a man, his name is Elkanah, and Elkanah has made a great mistake because he has married two wives. Now, all the men in here that are married, you can say amen to this. Listen, I can only steward one well. I don't know how in the world he thought it was a good idea to get two. So these are the results of polygamy you see right here. It's just confusion and chaos, right? So he marries two women. I don't know what he was thinking, but the man had two women. One of them was named Peninnah, and the other was named Hannah. Now, Peninnah, the Bible says, has all kinds of sons and all kinds of daughters. She has been so fruitful. And then on the other hand, you got Hannah, and Hannah is barren. And though she has been trying to get pregnant for years, unfortunately, she has come up empty, and she has no children. Now, Peninnah, her name actually means something interesting to me. If you look at the Hebrew word penina, you'll find that it means corner, meaning like a sharp edge, one of them things that you bump your shoulder on when you're going a little bit too fast around the penina. How many of you guys could acknowledge right now you got some peninas in your life? Yeah, you don't have to nudge the person next to you if they're your penina. But I know every now and then we're put in position where we have people who irritate us to the point of grieving. And that's exactly what's happening here for Hannah. Now, Hannah, her name, if you look that up in the Hebrew, means to show favor and to be greatly blessed and to have grace upon your life, to be gracious and yet, she doesn't have any kids. Anybody been in that position before where you've heard the Lord say in a place of prayer, I am blessed, I am highly favored, I have grace poured out over my life, and yet you look over and you notice that you're not as blessed as other people seem to be. Have you ever been there before? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about how to turn that position and that posture into a gift that you get to give God called desperation. Now, desperation is something that's been on my spirit for a number of weeks. I was writing this message in an airplane, and I was watching our prayer room on Thursday simultaneously. And as I'm typing up the message on my laptop, I'm clicking back over to our YouTube, and I hear Todd praying and asking the Lord, God, give us desperation. Lord, make our church more desperate. And I knew right away, I said, oh, this is the heartbeat of the Lord. This is exactly what we're supposed to lean into. Just before that, I was uh, standing here where I usually do during the worship, and Brian Nero was pouring his heart out, just like Hannah. I'm pouring my soul out before the Lord. And he hit his knees, and then he put his face on the ground and pushed the microphone away. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, give Brian a word. Tell Brian that he will be as anointed as he is desperate. Because there's something about the oil of the Spirit that is attracted to a heart posture of desperation. 
And so I know desperation is on the heart of the Lord. So I decided, man, I'm going to dive deep into desperation. I've got to learn about all I can learn about desperation. Now, every time I endeavor to learn something about a topic, what I normally do is I look at a Bible dictionary and then, just like a good preacher, I Google it. And here's why I do that, because I love to get word, words defined from a biblical perspective, and I love to get words defined from a worldly perspective so that I have the opportunity to choose. You see what I'm saying? It's like, nah, no, I do not want the world's definition of that word. I want, and I don't know if you guys have noticed, there's a lot of people changing a lot of words, but I want the Bible's definition of that word because I know it's everlasting and it ain't never going to go nowhere, and I can build my life on that word, and so I choose to. You get what I'm saying? Are you with me this morning? And so I'm like, okay, I want to know what the Bible has to say about desperation, but first, Google. And so here's what Google had to say from Merriam-Webster. It means, desperation means having lost hope, moved by despair, extreme suffering, and intense anxiety. Now, I don't know anybody who wants that. I read that and I'm like, nope. I rebuke that. And so now I'm hitting the books, right? Boom, boom. Oh, I'm about to find the biblical definition of desperate. It's going to be a blessing. Woo! I'm going to shout in this airplane. You know what I mean? But unfortunately, what I found was that the closest biblical word, and I looked up every single verse. I mean, every single verse, Old Testament and New Testament. I did the Hebrew. I did the Greek. I did the deep dive. And unfortunately, what I found is that the closest biblical word that we have for desperation means the exact same thing in the Bible as it does in Merriam-Webster's. Let me read it to you again. It means having lost hope. It means moved by despair. It means extreme suffering, and it means intense anxiety. Now, I know we're a charismatic Pentecostal church, and when I give a revival word like desperation, people are like, woo, woo. Hallelujah, yeah, impartation of desperation right here. Hey, I, I, used, to have this, I used to have this woman at, uh, it, she came to mission school with me, and when the spirit would hit her, she'd go. <laughs> and and I, I don't know why she did that, but then she started backing up. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I saw it in the spirit today. Some of y'all heard me say an impartation of desperation. Yeah, it, but listen, desperation is messy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, desperation is inconvenient. Yeah. There's no convenient time to be desperate because desperate people make everybody else uncomfortable. Yeah. They make people uncomfortable. Man, you're desperate. What is going on with you? You can't get anything done when you're desperate. Like, good luck checking off the boxes on your to-do list when you are so desperate before the Lord. Now, let me give you a better definition of desperation by looking at 1 Samuel chapter 1. Just a short list. Short list, meaning 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Eight different <laughs> characteristics of desperation. All right, here is the soul of Hannah's state. She's deeply distressed. She weeps bitterly. She's afflicted. She appears drunk. She gets rebuked by her pastor. What, yeah, I'm, some of y'all have been there before. You're like, man, I was just pouring out my heart before the Lord at the altar, and they tried to take up the, the tithe and offering, and pastor said, hey, man, you got to go back to your seat. You've been there before, right? Yeah, you've been there. Have you been there before? I've been there before. It troubled in spirit, verse 15. She has anxiety, and then she even refers to herself as being vexed, which means in the Hebrew, angry, right? And so how many of you guys could identify with any of these characteristics? Even if not right now, like you've been there before. So I know the tendency in temptation is to disconnect and separate yourself from the house of God and hide out in isolation. But I want you to observe with me the actions that are produced in the soul of Hannah as a result of her desperation. So the next time you find yourself desperate, or if you're desperate right now, you can choose. Everybody say, I can choose. I can choose. Everybody say, I'm powerful. I'm powerful. Listen, you don't got to be overcome by what's trying to overcome you. We just read it out in the offering. You are the head and not the tail. You're the victor. I'm the victor. Somebody needs to look themselves in the eye in the mirror and just say that over yourself every single day. I am the victor. Come on. 
I'm not what's been done to me. I am what's been done for me through the cross of Calvary. Hallelujah. I'm blood bought, sanctified, covered and protected in Jesus name. And so what happens? Her soul state produces a certain number of actions, like seven more. So let me give them to you real quick. You can take a picture of them. All right, she starts fasting, Amen. which is what we're going to do today. Yeah. I mean, maybe not everybody today, but what I'm going to try to do by the end of here is get you guys to sign up. And I'm going to sign up with you. Is that the next seven days, somebody, every minute of the day, is going to be fasting yeah. for God to move powerfully in our church. Amen? Amen. So she fasts. She goes to God's house. She, it, it wasn't even church. It wasn't even Sunday. It wasn't even prayer room. She goes and prays on the porch. She doesn't even get let inside. She prays to the Lord. She vows a vow, meaning she starts to make promises. You ever been there before? Yeah. God, if you'd just give me a son. Yeah. At this point, I'm so desperate, I'll give him back to you. Yeah. Right? She petitions, and then she pours out her soul to God, and it happens in public there is something very primitive about the heart's cry of desperation because it doesn't check for nobody I don't care what you think about it you might try to film me and turn me into a meme but I'm gonna give God praise in his house because I'm desperate I don't care who says what you better watch out get out of my way because I must touch heaven and let me tell you, all throughout the New Testament, you will watch Jesus rebuke people who pursue him out of well-thought-out theological motivations, and yet you will never see Jesus push anybody away for good that comes to them acknowledging their need in a posture of desperation. Even when he got close, whenever we look at that passage where it says, Oh, Jesus called that woman a dog. You see, desperation never takes no for an answer. Even when she could have been insulted and turned her back on her only solution, she said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And in that very moment, Jesus responded to her desperation with a blessing, just like Hannah, because it had to do with her lineage, and it rebuked the devourer off that daughter's life. She was delivered, and that demon that had possessed her got sent packing, and she was healed in her body in the very same moment. And Jesus said, I haven't seen faith like this in the whole country. You see, desperation, there's something about the heart of God that looks at you in your desperation and finds you irresistible. Blessed are you when you mourn. For the Lord says you'll be comforted. Blessed are you when you are poor in spirit. For the Lord says that the kingdom of heaven is going to break out for you. In the Psalms, he says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. David goes on to say the sacrifices that you're looking for is not just the cryptocurrency through the new giving platform, but it is a broken and contrite spirit before the Lord. What does that look like? I'm desperate. I'm dependent. I ain't got it all figured out. I don't know what I'm doing. My solutions are not working. I need supernatural intervention from the Holy Ghost. You with me, church? Tell your neighbors, say, get desperate. Because here's what happens. Eli blessed her. She received pre uh, peace. Uh, her, her prayers got answered. She got favor. She got to break her fast. Hallelujah. Doesn't it feel good when you get to break your fast? Woo! That's favor from the Lord right there. She's no longer sad. She freely worships. The Lord remembers her. She conceives, then gives birth, and she knows my prayers have been answered. That's the type of blessing desperation produces. So y'all say it with me. Say, Lord, make us desperate. Do you mean it? I know it's scary. I, I, know, I know it's scary. I know it's scary, and I, and I know sometimes when we, when we ask the Lord to make us desperate, it can be scary because we look at circumstances like this, and we say, if that's what it takes for me to be desperate, then I say no, even though I think it might be what I need. Listen, it's not that you have to go through hard things to be desperate, but you have to stay close to people going through hard things so that you can stay desperate. Listen, I'm giving you guys a kingdom key right there because it's often what produces desperation in me, church, is a bad scenario. So when I pray, God, make me desperate, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want the Lord to say, make my life a living hell, please. 
What I want the Spirit to do is soften my heart to the point that even when I see somebody else desperate, I'm going to get in it with them. And I'm going to mourn with those who mourn. I'm going to cry with those who cry. I'm going to pray with those who pray. Your God is my God. We're going to sit in this together. I'm going to feel what you feel because I don't want to be, I don't want to be dispossessed from desperation. Desperation is a posture that gets blessed, not arrogance. So if, if we're going to be desperate, we've got to deal with some distractions. I'm going to give you guys three points real quick. If you want to stay desperate, you've got to deal, number one, with the distraction of the double portion. Uh-oh. Hold on, wait, Pastor. I thought a double portion was a good thing. Well, it is, unless it becomes a distraction. So, so if, you, if you look at the story here, what you'll recognize is that Elkanah loves his wife Hannah so much that he says, I'm going to give Peninnah, uh, you know, uh, some resources. I'm going to give her sons and her daughters some resources. But Hannah, you, sis, oh, my beloved bride, I'm going to give you a double portion. And I know we love this language as well, like a double portion. Somebody says double portion. You know what I'm saying? Like you just, it just hits you all the double. Hey, felt that in my spirit. Hallelujah. But listen, a double portion is plenty for most people. If you give them double of what they need, they'll hush. You give them double of what they need, they'll stop praying. You give them double of what they need, they'll stop praising. You give them double of what they need, they'll lose all their gratitude. You give them double of what they need, they'll stop coming to church. You give them double of what they need, they'll stop engaging with everything, the Bible, fellowship, everything. I mean, I'm, I'm so blessed. I got that double portion. I'm too big for my britches. I don't even need a pastor anymore, in fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, how many people do you know get a little bit of money and stop praising? Listen, um, if the only time you'll pray is when you want something, God will bless you by not giving it to you so that you'll keep on praying. If, if I knew what my wife wanted and I knew that when I gave it to her, she'd stop talking to me, I'd never give it to her because I value our connection more than I do her blessing. And some of us can't figure out why we can't prevail in prayer. Why is God not giving me the thing I'm asking for? Because the only time you pray is to ask him for presents. Oh, my goodness. I woke up feeling my Wheaties this morning. I can tell you guys are not ready for this energy. Listen, you give some people double of what they need, you'll render them completely ineffective for the kingdom of God. Listen, the devil will pay you to be quiet. I, I, some people, where, where you going, where you get that from, Pastor? Well, you can read it in the New Testament as God, uh, Jesus, he gives us all kinds of illustrations talking about the distraction that blessing can become. Because anytime you get blessed, like a double portion, you get blessed, that should always lead you into more intimacy with God. So anytime your blessing becomes a distraction from your connection with Jesus, it's no longer a blessing. It's a distraction to your desperation. Hey. Listen, the devil don't mind a little bit of money in your pocket if it'll calm you down. And we got plenty of people out here calling distractions, promotions, and footholds favor. We have to remember the purpose of the double portion. The purpose of the double portion was for worship. Yeah. What happened? Elkanah said, here, I want you to have this. Why did he want, why, why did Elkanah want her to have the double portion? So that she could worship more, not stunt more. Not show off more, not seem to be more flashy, not get more Instagram follows. Like the reason why God gives you a double portion so that you can go more all in in worship. Yeah. Have I stepped on everybody's toes yet? I'm so close. I know I'm so close. Here's number two. Here's a distraction to desperation, competition and comparison. Competition and comparison. You remember what the Bible said? It said her rival... Everybody say her rival. Her rival? rival? <laughs> Is it a competition? Huh. Well, it must be. H how many of us are stuck, no longer hungry for what God wants to do in our lives because we're preoccupied with beating somebody else? Now, I looked a word up in the Hebrew. The rivalry, rivalry, it means adversary, but it also means like narrow and tight. 
Isn't that a good picture of what rivalry, competition, and comparison feels like to the human soul? Because your whole world, your whole life gets really tight. It gets really narrow. It gets really focused. And the only thing that you live for is competing and comparing with that one person that you think by beating them, it proves that you're worthy of being loved. You know what I'm talking about, church. I've been there before. Listen, I've felt competition in comparison more times than I can count. I grew up an athlete, so it was like bread in me. Like you got to be the best. And by being the best, it's not just being your best. It's being better than everybody else. And then after you beat them, looking at them and reminding them of it. Listen, I've wrestled with this deeply in my own life and ministry, church. I remember there was a season I would wake up at like 4.30 in the morning because I was like, our church isn't growing. But the church across town is growing. I bet those pastors get up really early and pray. I'm going to beat them up. I'm going to be up before they get up. I don't know what time they wake up, but I'm going to be up before they wake up, Lord. And I'm going to ask you, come on, God, bless us. See, they, they sleeping. Isn't it interesting, though, that we think that to grab God's attention, we've got to, you know, uh, like, like stomp our spiritual siblings into the dust. As though by making them less visible, we become more visible. Can, can I tell you, nobody has what belongs to you. So, so here's the lie. Here is the lie that propagates competition and comparison in the kingdom. It is believing the lie that somebody has what's yours. This is all competition and comparison in the spirit hinges on this one thing. Is believing a lie, somebody's got what's mine. If it was yours, they wouldn't have it. And if you don't have it, it's because God has it. And he hasn't released it to you yet in his time. So look into somebody else as though they have somehow stolen something that God wanted to give you. Would mean they were able to rob God. And there's only one time in the scripture that, peop, that, that God says we're able to rob them. And you know what that's from? Tithe and offering. Hallelujah. Wow. I didn't know how to I'd sneak that in there. But my God, man, that was good. Uh, okay. Here's the last distraction to desperation. Number three, we're going to pray. Well-meaning people. Uh-oh. See, desperation is inconvenient. You ever been in a place of like fasting and prayer and perseverance and you've been like, I mean, you're in it. And somebody's like, hey, bro, calm down. Chill out. You're shouting in church. It, it, it doesn't take all that. You, you don't have to do all that. All right, all right, you need to just chill out. Well-meaning people can become a distraction to desperation. And it's true because the passionate are always going to offend the apathetic. And people who are aggressive are always going to offend the stationary. Look, we cannot allow well-meaning people to become distractions to our desperation. Elkanah said, am I not more to you than ten sons? He didn't mean ten. He meant like a thousand. It didn't matter. It was rhetorical. Ten was just an arbitrary number to say, it doesn't matter how many kids you have. Look at me. You got me. Here, eat some food. You ever been so hungry for God that you will not be, you just will not be distracted? That's the type of desperation that I'm going to pray for us to have today, church. And if you're willing, that's the type of desperation that I want you to courageously ask the Holy Spirit for. Would you do that today? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because I want to be desperate. I want to be stirred up. And so as promised, um, what I want to do is I want to invite you to join the team this week that fast. And there's no manipulation involved in this. I mean that. I just want... You guys to be able to take a commitment before the Lord. I don't care who stands up when. It doesn't matter to me. But what I'm going to do is just I'm going to go through Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And what I'm going to invite you to do is just put your name on the list to say I will fast from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. 24 hours. I will fast from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. So I'm just going to go through the calendar here. And if at the point in time in which you sense, yep, I'm going to do that. I just want to ask you to stand. If you'll fast tonight from 6 p.m. to Monday, 6 p.m., would you be willing to stand? If you'll fast tomorrow from 6 p.m. Monday to Tuesday, would you be willing to stand? If you'll do Wednesday or Tuesday, my bad, Tuesday, 6 p.m. to Wednesday, awesome. If you'll do Wednesday, amazing. If you'll do Thursday, just stand up. 
If you'll do Friday, would you stand up? And if you'll do Saturday, would you stand up? Awesome. I see you guys. Come on, let's bless these guys who have stood up. You guys are going to stay standing. You guys, Stay standing, please. Everybody stand up with them. This is going to be our fasting team for the week. And here's the point. Every second of every day for the next seven days, we're going to be unbroken in our unity and our perseverance to ask the Holy Spirit for desperation. So let's start today. Lord, we ask you in Jesus' name to make us desperate. Though it might be a scary prayer, God, we believe that you are a safe, safe, faithful, good Father. And just because it hurts sometimes and the desperation produces in us cries of despair, it doesn't make you any less good. We trust you with our hearts, God, and we ask that you'd make us desperate for you. Put an outcry in this church that moves you and moves us in an unprecedented way. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Come on, let's bless the Lord together.